Hello and welcome to Fusion News, brought to you by the Fusion Industry Association. My name is Jeff Peachman and I'm a graduate student at University of Washington studying plasmas. Today's stories are 1. Scientists claim AI breakthrough to generate boundless, clean fusion energy. 2. TVA's closed Bull Run plant could get second life harnessing fuel hotter than the sun. 3. UK and Canada team up to solve nuclear fusion fuel shortage. And 4. House approves bipartisan bill aimed at bolstering nuclear energy. And like always, I've got a few bonus stories at the end, so stick around. 1. Scientists claim AI breakthrough to generate boundless, clean fusion energy. So to make net energy from a fusion reaction, we must confine fusion fuels at high temperature and density. And the most common way of doing that is to use magnetic fields. But these configurations can become unstable. One type of instability is called the tearing instability. And when tearing occurs, magnetic field lines break and then reconnect, which releases energy which can damage the power plant. It can also stop the fusion reaction from happening. Recently, a team of researchers from Princeton used AI to predict and prevent the tearing instability. Their findings were published in Nature on February 21st, and it has seen wide media coverage since uh, from sources including Vice News, CNN, Independent, and Newsweek. This AI model is trained using a technique called reinforcement learning, which means it wants to maximize some reward function, just like how when you train your dog with a new trick, you reward it with a treat. The AI is rewarded for maintaining a high pressure plasma with a low probability of tearing instabilities. The AI knows nothing about plasma physics. It's trained using real data from previous tokamak experiments. And from many, many examples, it's learned which actions lead to the stable plasma which it gets rewarded for. So this AI uses sensors to monitor a tokamak plasma in real time and then actively controls it to prevent instabilities. So to help explain what this means, I want to use a quick analogy. You may have tried to balance a broomstick on the palm of your hand, and that's an unstable system. If you don't move your hand, the broomstick falls over. But if you move your hand in the right ways, you can keep it stable. So that's active control to prevent an instability. The AI is doing something similar, except instead of moving its hand around, it's changing the shape of the plasma by changing the power of the magnets or it's changing how the plasma is heated by changing the power of particle beams. And it's doing this very quickly. It can predict an instability about three-tenths of a second before it happens. And then it can get the plasma under control. This was tested successfully at the D3D tokamak in San Diego. Although tearing instabilities are just one of the challenges that we face, it's a significant hurdle to achieving fusion energy with magnetic confinement. And this technology might not stop here. The paper also speculates about how this could be extended. For example, robust control of a plasma may enable high performance operating modes that we just can't do today. Another exciting possibility is that we may discover new types of self-generated currents. That would greatly reduce the cost of tokamaks, which have expensive systems to drive current through the plasma. So I think this research gives us a lot to be optimistic about, and I'm really excited to see AI used more in the fusion space. Two. TVA's closed Bull Run plant could get second life harnessing fuel hotter than the sun. Type 1 Energy, which is an FIA member company, announced plans to construct a pilot fusion power plant at the site of a former coal plant in Clinton, Tennessee. Bull Run Fossil Plant was once the world's largest coal power plant. It was operated by the Tennessee Valley Authority, who is an FIA affiliate member, from 1967 until 2023. It's somewhat poetic that a site where we burned millions of tons of coal could be used to develop a new source of clean, carbon-free energy. At this point, I'd like to highlight the great advantages of retrofitting a coal power plant for fusion energy. The steam turbines and the boilers are expensive components of any thermal power plant, and they already exist at these sites. The buildings are already connected to the grid in locations which are built to distribute megawatts or sometimes gigawatts of power. This significantly reduces the infrastructure costs. And so for this reason, many fusion companies are looking into the idea, such as Zap Energy and Tokamak Energy. In the case of Type 1 Energy, this prototype is not intended to supply power to the grid, 
but siting the pilot plant at this location enables engineers to integrate their core product with these other power generating systems which are required to make a practical power plant. Type 1 Energy plans to build an advanced Stellarator called Infinity 1. And for those who don't know, Stellarators are really cool toroidal magnetic confinement devices. They're somewhat similar to the more common tokamak, uh, but they have important advantages, such as better stability and continuous operation. Unlike a tokamak, the magnets themselves are twisted, so you don't need to drive a current through the plasma. Construction of Infinity One is slated to commence in 2025, and if all goes well, it could be operating in 2028. Type One Energy also plans to establish its headquarters in Tennessee, which should generate over 300 high paying jobs within five years. They also plan to invest $223 million in the region, so this is great news for the local economy. In addition to the partnership with TVA, Type 1 is also working with Oak Ridge National Laboratory to expand its fusion projects in the region, so we might expect that area to become a fusion hub in the future. And this project signifies a significant step towards realizing fusion's commercial potential and establishing Tennessee as a hub for clean energy. Three. UK and Canada team up to solve nuclear fusion fuel shortage. The easiest fusion reaction that we can do is to fuse deuterium and tritium. These are both heavy isotopes of hydrogen. Deuterium is everywhere, it's abundant in seawater, but tritium is really rare. There are no natural reserves of tritium because it gradually decays into helium-3 with a 12-year half-life. In fact, there's a global inventory of maybe only about 25 to 30 kilograms of tritium. So fusion power plants which use these fuels will be designed to breed their own supply of tritium. The plan is to surround the plasma with a breeder blanket containing lithium. Then we allow fusion neutrons to strike the lithium, which transmutes it into tritium. That all sounds great, but there's a few problems. The first most obvious problem is that we have a chicken and the egg problem. Power plants need to be running to make tritium, but they need tritium to run. So we need an external supply of tritium to commission new power plants. The second problem is that no one's demonstrated a tritium breeding blanket. We know the physics of the process, and we already breed tritium on small scales, but an engineered product that efficiently removes tritium from a blanket, then purifies it, and then feeds it back into a fusion power plant does not yet exist. If we don't know how fast or efficiently these systems work, we can't predict how much tritium is going to be needed to commission new power plants. To address these challenges, the UK Atomic Energy Authority is teaming up with Canadian National Laboratories, or CNL, to improve technologies that breed and extract tritium. The first project will analyze materials for isotope separation at CNL's Chalk River facilities in Ontario and the UK AEA's facilities in Colum, Oxfordshire. Since demand for tritium is expected to increase, it's possible that Canada will be in a powerful position as the world's leading supplier of tritium. So it makes a lot of sense to establish these partnerships now. And four, House approves bipartisan bill aimed at bolstering nuclear energy. On February 28th, the US House of Representatives passed the Bipartisan Atomic Energy Advancement Act. While most of the act concerns nuclear fission, an important part of it concerns the regulation of fusion power plants. Last year, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission determined that fusion regulations would be separate from fission regulations. This new act of Congress would elevate that policy from regulation into law, which brings long-term regulatory certainty to the growing fusion industry. And this is extremely important for this industry to exceed, so I was very excited to hear this news. That was our last major story, but I have three bonus stories for you. The first is FIA affiliate member Helical Fusion, who announced that they achieved a breakthrough with an advanced superconducting cable. They tested their superconducting cable with a current of 20 kiloamps in a superconductor four meters long. And their design also includes a joint, which enables the cable to be made longer by connecting other superconductors to it. The next bonus story is a summary of the Fusion X Invest Conference, which was held in Boston last week. This is an event which connects investors with entrepreneurs in the fusion industry. And the last bonus story is a reminder that the FIA is hosting its annual policy conference from March 20th to 21st. If you want to connect with policymakers, fusion companies, or investors, then you should check it out. That's all the fusion news this week. I hope you enjoyed the stories, and if you did, press like and subscribe. Also, check out the descriptions below uh, for links to all the stories. 
And once again, I'm Jeff Peachman, and thanks for watching.